el primer ponente, el que tiene la ponencia. The first Marcos. speaker today is the Jesuit Dan Harnett. Dan was born in Chicago, and in fact, he's done absolutely everything, or at least been in most of the different activities that a Jesuit can be about. He's been in the missions, he's been a chaplain, he's worked in the world of academia. Dan Harnett spent more than 20 years in Peru, and 15 out of those 20, he spent living and working in one of the poorest districts of Lima. He worked a lot in the community. He worked to try and make sure that those populations had access to basic services. And he also carried out pastoral work in that same district in Lima. He was requested to collaborate with the creation of the university of the society, the Montoya University. He worked there for some years, then he went back to his province in Chicago and he worked in the University of Chicago of the Jesuits. And then he was destined to work in pastoral work. So if you look for him, if you Google him, as we say, he is really a great giver a great person accompanying in the exercises. According to his students, he's a fantastic teacher. And according to those people who know him, he is a humble, delightful person. You have the floor. That's what I've been told. Dan Harnett then is going to be talking to us about encountering God in unexpected places. And we are really desiring to listen to you. Thank you. Good morning to you all. Thank you very much indeed for this presentation. So generous, excessively generous, I would say. My life among the Jesuits has had two parts, really one part in Peru. I belong to the Peru province and then the other part of my life has been spent in Chicago. So in fact, maybe I'm going to contextualize somewhat simply so that we can, well, contextualize better. You know that in order to understand what I'm going to be talking about, because of course, today in a certain way, what we are doing, I think, well, yesterday we started with this text of the exercises, the first apostolic preference, okay, the, the first universal apostolic preference, right? And today, And today we are linking the first universal apostolic preference with the second. And I think that to understand, or at least my experience, right? When I was sent to El Agustino after being ordained after my, well, uh, special studies, I was very privileged to study with Luis Magriña in the University of Chicago. We studied together many, many years ago. And the provincial sent me to Peru. And it was really for me a blessing, I have to say. I would say the greatest blessing of my life, truly, because it really defined the way in which I see the church, the way in which I see the society, and the way in which I see the spiritual exercises. But it's important to admit that when I got to Peru in the 70s, last century, you know full well uh, that the, the Vatican Concilium ended in 1965, right? So in Latin America, there was a kind of Pentecostal situation in the sense that the bishops, when they went back to Latin America after the Second Vatican, they said, "How what a beautiful experience we've had in Rome. Wouldn't it be lovely to have this uh, Second Vatican happening in Latin America? And they started uh, the preparations for the Medellin uh, Congress. The side note, really. And then there have been many more in Latin America, Medellin, Puebla, 79, Santo Domingo, 1984, 
and others. So this, for example, has not happened in the United States. And one can really tell the difference. Yes, it's quite a, a, a big difference. So this um, it, either for good or for bad, it might have limitations. But I do believe these congresses have maintained the church alive. And when I got to Lima in the 70s, the church there was experiencing this Pentecostal movement. The company itself was opening uh, new works everywhere. And up till that moment, although yes, the, we had a presence in you know popular sectors, we essentially tended to work only with the middle classes. And then after that, we started working in more popular districts in as a grassroots actions with um, uh, farmers, indigenous communities, all in all people who had been excluded or somewhat forgotten in one way or another. And then that in the first place. And then I got to El Agustino. What is this place, El Agustino? Lima, you might know, is a city. It, then in the 70s, it had 10 million inhabitants in a country of 30 million inhabitants. So Lima had 10 million, one third of the population. So it was really a, a city with a lot, a lot of people. And however, the people kept coming in droves from the Andes to the capital. Why? Because obviously in the Andes, people didn't have um, adequate health services. There was no adequate education. And these people sold their chakras, that is those very small plots and small farms. And they got to the city of Lima hoping to find a better life for their families, for their offspring, for their grandchildren. But what they found in Lima was, in a way, what uh, Jesus, Joseph and Mary, there was no place for them in Lima. Lima was expensive then. It's even more expensive now. And furthermore, there was no space. And people started occupying the margins, the slopes, the cerros that they call, yes, those uh, small hills and mountains surrounding Lima. There are seven hills. And uh, the society there started uh, in a parochial sense in one of the parishes in El Agustino. It's one of the hills. It's not Jesuit El Agustino, it is called. And that's where we started our Jesuit work. When we got there, there were 100,000 people living in that hill, 100,000. And we asked the provincial, we said, listen, what do you want us to do here? And he said, well, do what you can and what you think is fit. And if I remember correctly, we weren't given any money either. So we went really like those first disciples. We were sent without sandals, without what do you call it? The knapsack. Yeah, without a knapsack. And well, at the beginning, I thought it was somewhat daring. I mean, we were three only, a Jesuit, a Spaniard, and a gringo. I was the American guy. And we were sent there. And I thought it was somewhat daring to go there, practically with nothing. Well, yes, goodwill, definitely, faith, plenty, but um, no resources. And however, I, I got to understand the wisdom of Jesus, I think, in truth, when Jesus sent his disciples with no B plan or C or D, right? With no support systems, so to speak. Jesus sent his first disciples in poverty. And this is the way we were sent by the provincial in poverty. And the wisdom there comes because he knew that we he knew that we would have, have to learn from the people themselves. When we got to El Agustino, 
the neighbors, the people were living there, as I said, 100,000 people living there already with no parish. They were Catholics in principle, they were Catholics, but they didn't have much possibility of practicing their faith as regards uh, liturgy. And however, they taught us so much as to the holiness. I have I have the text, I should follow the text, I guess. Anyway, so the first thing I would like to say is that we realized when we got there with nothing, no indication, we realized and we discovered the importance of accompanying the people, especially accompanying the people in their struggle, their struggle and Yes, we, we gave pastoral services, pastoral counseling. We started uh, forming these small Christian communities, but especially we started uh, working with them in their fight for basic services. There was no water, no sewage system, no electricity in that place. So as you might well imagine, uh, it's it makes life pretty difficult for people when you don't have basic services. And we talk about a place where there's no sewage and no drinking water, you're talking of high child mortality, right? Because people had to consume water that came in special lorries, in special trucks that came then. They were actually, you know, put that dirty water in barrels in a number of different huts everywhere. And, all in all, of course, children paid the price of this lack of hygiene. We had so many funerals. It was mostly our main work at the beginning. All those funerals and we would also be first in the homes and then we would accompany the people with those small white coffins. We would walk with the families to the cemetery because none of them could pay for any means of transport. We would walk. A, a number of kilometers to get to the cemetery and uh, of course uh, doing it by turns to carry the coffin on our shoulders uh, those wakes i still remember uh, it, it was it caused quite an impact in me you had to walk as well with these young couples that had lost their children it's it's, it's something terrible for anybody any parent, but in their case, it wasn't only the sadness of having lost uh, their children, but feeling guilty as well in that they had not been able to protect the life of their sons and daughters. So as I say, we started working as well and fighting to have drinking water, to have a sewage system. And we started, of course, um, getting the people to meet those who had um, lost their sons and daughters we got them to meet us and we asked them, what do you think, what should we do? And then we wrote a list of all the needs. There's no drinking water, no electricity, no sewage systems, a very, very long list of all the needs in the neighborhood, but you never read the most important need, organization. There was no organization. They were not organized to tackle that list of needs. So we, the Jesuits, started realizing that maybe our main contribution to that, because of course we were not engineers and we, I don't know, we came more with Plato and Hegel and not so much electricity and sewage, right? So in any case, we realized that we could help these people better organize their community. And that was then our first task. But we asked them, we said, what do you think? What do you think? Are you going to always have to see how your children die before their time? Is that normal? Do you think that God wants your children to die before their time? Do you think this has been God's will? Is there anything we can do to change this? Well, that kind of questions were questions that we would pose in the assemblies that we organized with these people. And there, the idea came to be of having a popular dining room. We said, well, let's make sure then that every child, every one of the young boys and girls of the neighborhood, let's make sure that they have at least one good warm meal a day. And this is the way we started our first dining room that very quickly spread 
and it eventually became, I think we got to have 66 of these dining rooms, a whole network of places where people could come to have a meal and they were part of our parish. But what is most important of that work that we did was, was not well, it was very important, of course. I mean, the multiplication, yes, of, of the bread, indeed. But I think as regards the organizational experience and the people there as well realized, they, they realized that they could organize and in this way they could better tackle the problems. So it's an experience and the atmosphere was an atmosphere of hope despite the the pain and the, and the deaths and the mourning, it was hope that prevailed. And also at the same time, the liberation theology was born. We had the privilege, you know, Gustavo Gutierrez, Peruvian, he worked with us and he would uh, actually call us every two weeks. He would call all those of us priests working in the popular neighborhoods. He would call us to meet and reflect on our experience. And from there came a certain vocabulary, a terminology we would say. And we started to establish a difference between structural poverty, spiritual poverty, and solidary poverty. Structural poverty is an evil. It is a sin. It is something not desired by God. It's structural poverty, that it's the poverty that we saw and that we experienced every day. It wasn't simply a pity or a serendipity, but rather it was a sin. And any Christian should in fact fight against it. Spiritual poverty, however, is an attitude reflecting the availability regarding God's will. That's the poverty that Jesus talks about or that Mary is reflecting in the Annunciation and we should all pray and we should all target and finally, solidary poverty, which is the commitment. And on the one hand, this solidary poverty is protesting against the situation of our sisters and brothers. And this is then the poverty that Jesus and Ignatius invite us to. We could say that uh, the first poverty is structural poverty is the poverty that one meditates on during the first week of the exercises, right? With when you go into the personal and structural sin analysis. The second type of poverty, spiritual poverty, actually takes us to the beginning of the second week with the meditation of the eternal king and the contemplation of the incarnation of Nazareth. And there we see Jesus, who is inviting us to walk with him and live the way he lives in poverty. And then we see how Jesus was born in poverty. While the third poverty, solidary poverty, the poverty of solidarity, corresponds to the life election that is done later during the exercises after having meditated uh, about the two flags and the three ways of humility. Does it make sense? Those three poverties, yes, related to the spiritual exercises. Now I, I would like to walk and simply share my thoughts with you about the different stages of the exercises. Maybe from my experience of uh, carrying out two exercises with these uh, grassroots districts, first of all, I have to say that as you all know, Pope Francis talks a lot about creating a, a culture of encounter, a culture in which we all meet in a certain way, 
this invitation to creating a culture of encounter is is built on pillars as i said of the of vatican of the second vatican because i remember especially the synod of justice the church saw with greater clarity the charity was not sufficient charity works had to be accompanied by a sustainable and direct uh, wish for justice. The insistence was that justice is not just a word to be added to charity, but rather a constitutive dimension of the church's actions themselves. And the society actually took this to heart in 1974, 1975, yes, in the congregation. And Francis now went a step further in talking about the importance of the culture of encounter, because as well as justice and charity together, now we have to make sure that we create this encounter, the importance of human relationships. It is fundamental for any effort to make the world a home for all. So to talk about a, a culture of encounter might seem an impossible mission nowadays because the times we are living, it seems that what defines us most is that in fact, we are not encountering each other. We are not meeting in the economic dimension, we are living very different lives. In the political dimension, we also are, have different or divergent commitments. And social networks, instead of making us come together and uniting us, are separating us, in fact. So then what might be the starting point for the creation of um, a culture that goes towards encounter? There are no prescriptions or other recipes, but I think that the four um, apostolic preferences of the society do contribute important clues. And this is where the spiritual exercises can in fact contribute a lot, precisely because they move among the terrain of what is spiritual. And more than any other, It is where we are, in fact, in a situation of equality uh, because we are not, there's no equality in what is social, economic, cultural, but spiritually, yes, we are all sons and daughters of God. Radical equality here. The society has then adapted its works to better respond to the demands of our times. Efforts have been made to place the spiritual exercises somewhere where different groups of people can in fact do them. And I think that this posture means to be loyal and faithful to the principles to be found in the exercises themselves. The exercises, and I quote, should adapt to their audience and the conditions of the retreatants that decide to go through them. Whereas originally the complete experience of the 30 days of the exercises can be limited to persons that would prepare for this. And the exercises typically were given in uh, houses of retreat during recent years, we have uh, been discovering new ways of sharing the richness of the exercises with more diverse audiences, and especially with groups of persons who are on the margins of society, who are excluded and sometimes are forgotten by society. I think then that nowadays we should ask what in fact is changing and what doesn't change when one is giving the exercises in the midst of a context of acute social suffering, margination, exclusion, poverty. 
versus the situation in which one is giving the exercises in a more comfort comfortable context or maybe when social problems seem far away or seem to belong to others what changes I, I want to reflect somewhat on my experience. I would like to share with you all my experience. First and foremost, before we talk about principle and foundation in each one of the four weeks, I would like to, to talk a bit about silence. Silence, we all know in retreat, is a blessing. It's a blessing for any person doing the exercises. But I would say most especially for the persons who are very anxious, overburdened, disturbed people coming from places like El Agustino, where I was in Lima, people who very rarely could in fact enjoy silence. We in our hut there could hear the conversations of the people living in the huts nearby. We were so close to each other, higgledy piggledy all around the hill. And the, the silence then was so important and the silence of the exercises is so important. We went there and we started working with the young people of CVX. We couldn't, well, we didn't do much with the exercises and the, the, the fathers of families because they worked from 4 a.m. to 10 o'clock at night, most of them peddlers um, in Lima, the capital. But uh, we were able to work with their sons and daughters and we started uh, forming uh, Christian life communities. And at Easter, we would take a group of these young people to the exercises first. It was three days, the weekend exercises. Then in the second year, we went on to five days, third year, eight days. And in this way, well, we did this for 10 to 15 years. And uh, we took more than 100 persons every time to do the exercises. And the director of the retreat home uh, was a nun and she would say, Father, what? do you do? I don't know how you manage. These young people are so silent. Here we have a retreat with priests from different congregations. Listen, we have nuns from different orders and silence. No way. They keep chatting all the time. But the young people that you bring along, the young people from your parish are incredible. They really keep silence perfectly. And we didn't demand all that much. We were not there as police officers, not at all. We simply realized that they valued silence so much. Silence was so important. They treasured silence. They really did. So principle and foundation. So what changes and what doesn't? Some people think the, this principle and foundation sounds a bit abstract, especially comparing with the exercises of the second week, right? But the basic truth of principle and foundation is communicating something that's a consolation and that's very convincing and important at the same time for the poor people who are called to existence for God and from God. And it is very important for people to, to hear right from the beginning during retreat, the words, don't fear, I'm with you, you are important for me, I love you. Come to me, those who are tired and oppressed. In me, they, will, they shall find solace. So although for some people, this principle and foundation might seem somewhat abstract, at least in my experience with persons in situations of extreme poverty in those popular neighborhoods, they immediately seize the meaning, they understand it. And for them, it's like a map of where we come from, where we're we going to, and where are we right now? As we would say, a GPS, right? It's it, it places us, it locates us, and they, they understand it immediately. Right now, I have the privilege of giving the spiritual exercises to inmates, people in prison, men and women in prison, uh, separately because um, the different buildings uh, of the prison. And however, they understand exactly, immediately, the wisdom 
they seize that wisdom of principle and foundation because they believe that and they understand that they have lost their freedom and that has had a cost and they lost their freedom because they ended too close to certain things and those affections or that being close to something really made their lives difficult. Of course, the fact is that all human beings, all of us uh, become close to things and we feel affection and we want things that are not necessarily evil, but that eventually do displace the love of God and they isolate all of us from each other. And although it is true that the persons who've lived in poverty tend to be very free about things precisely because they've learned to live with much less, nobody is ever free from want and need and desire. And as I said, I, I found it interesting to see how quickly the men and women in prison, the inmates understood this uh, idea of Ignatius and they fully agreed with him. They acknowledged that gradually their addictions were creating false gods, true idols. And different, of course, from God in life who always expands our freedom and who always unites us with others, these idols tend to capture and colonize our freedom in the worst possible way. Then thinking about the first week, what changes? Obviously, there is no time to go one by one through all the exercises of the first week in which we face uh, moral evil and sin because we have sinned. And we should not romanticize the peoples as though they were with no sin. They are sinners as well, the same as we all are. But do let me assimilate a couple of areas where I do see some differences. First of all, it has to do with the personal sin. I would say in general terms that the uh, people of the lower classes mm, don't they're not reluctant to acknowledge their sin, okay? It's like the St. Luke parable, yes? I mean, they're, they are honest and humble, and truly, it, it, it moves one. They are really honest about it. However, very often, they find it more difficult to understand how God's forgiveness is totally unconditional, at least in my experience. And each one of our, I mean, obviously, each one of our experiences might vary. Please, I don't want to present my experiences as, as, as a standard to you all, not at all, far be it from me. But there is a tendency sometimes towards, mm, mm, well, always defending this feeling of guilt. In some cases, it can be scruples. But I think that Mostly, it reflects uh, this uh, a deficient catechesis training. For example, in the parish where I, I work now, the people the, don't dare come for communion. This is changing gradually, yes, and it changed with our new training, of course. But they think that Eucharist means purity of life that they don't possess. And that is why they are reticent. And it is so sad to see that even in their children's first communion, they come close and they themselves don't receive the first communion, despite the fact that we have offered them many, many opportunities for confession. But they, it's not that they have great sins to confess, but rather they feel that they are in a situation of sin very often because they are, um, they've been married um, civilly or they are common law and they've not married religiously, for example. Um, well, now we are working and doing as much as is possible to actually normalize these situations for them to overcome this deficiency because it's such a pity, it's so sad, truly to see this, how they have this awareness of their own sin. Secondly, social sin. In situations of extreme poverty, at least where most 
are in circumstances of poverty, as is the case of El Agostino Hill that I mentioned before, people show less tendency to feel guilty about poverty. They realize that, well, here we are, 100,000 persons suffering poverty, obviously. Well, we are not to blame for this poverty. However, in the United States of America, we work with people as well who are homeless, who sleep on mattresses and the bridges, and they, yes, do very often feel that they are a failure individually. And there is less solidarity in that poverty that they experience. I would like to mention that it's good when we talk about persons in poverty. We should not talk so much about the poor because society reifies persons in situation of poverty, calling them the poor or the homeless or those indocumented. So easily you reduce a person to the person's circumstances, but one should never forget that every person is much more than his or her current circumstances. The first week, both as regards personal sin and social sin, helps discover the active dimension, the one I provoke, as their passive dimension, the one that I suffer. And because of this, the process of the first week has really uh, a, a releasing power and also the power to reveal, to unveil, because it helps us give a name to what is preventing us to be what we are called to be. And that's why St. Ignatius uh, proposes that we do put forward the grace of this eternal knowledge of my sin and uh, to abhor my sin and to feel the disorder of all this so that uh, by abhorring, I will become better. Ignatius was convinced about the fact that the person who tries to reform the world has to start always, first and foremost, by him or herself, because if that is not the case, the work and the result will be lost. I think that working with these people these excluded people or people in extreme poverty, the meditation of hell is not really necessary, or at least the way I see it, because those who live in social exclusion experience hell on earth every moment of the day. So to become aware of the fact of that one is living in evil or see this chain that that leads to consequences and to this state can be a motivation to want to leave hell behind, or at least not to, to bargain about this. But let's, let's go on now to the second week. One ends the first week by asking, what should I do for Christ? What should we do for Christ? And in the second week, one discovers that Christ is inviting us to be his companions, his colleagues, to participate in his own, his very own mission. But for this to happen, a person has to be endowed, uh, first of all, with the mind and then the heart of Jesus to love him, to better follow him. So, in the second week, it's not so much as you know, and you know better than I do, it's not a question simply of extracting some ideas, some pretty ideas out of every meditation, but rather one has to go really into the school of disciples, yes? In a certain way, in the second week, we become contemporary with the first disciples of Christ. We encounter those first disciples and we let ourselves be trained and taught by Jesus. In that sense, every scene of the gospel becomes a kind of pedagogical space. And from the beginning, Jesus speaks 
speaks a new language. And in fact, he wanted to defend this new language everywhere. Undoubtedly, I think, and I think we said this uh, yesterday evening, the, the central nucleus of, of what Jesus preached consisted of what he called the kingdom of God, a reality which is uh, already emerging in our lives. It can be accepted or it can be rejected, but it is good news, good news, including everyone, anyone that allows to be transformed and go into the kingdom of God. So then through words, through um, healing actions, that not only healed, but took people out of exclusion, Jesus invited people to see life through new eyes, through a new gaze. And everything that Jesus says and does finds its sense and meaning in the proposal of the kingdom, which is a new way of seeing God, of seeing the others, of seeing oneself. So, all in all, to talk about the kingdom means to talk about the new culture of encounter. Unfortunately, I think this uh, works both in poor areas, well, maybe even more for, for non uh, poor or popular areas, because many Christians don't understand properly what's really new in the message coming from Jesus, yes, and the what's inherent to this message, what has to be changed and accepted. This is understandable because Jesus Christ, in fact, is not a, a person or a character easy to classify. I mean, is he a Jew? Is he Pharisee? Is he, what is he? He's not a monk. Uh, what is he? Who is he? What's his adscription? But I do declare that Jesus is a free man living for God and for the others and living to to preach and share the dream of God for the world. Maybe, although at no time did Jesus define exactly what the kingdom of God was in fact, one can infer what it might be. It's enough to pay attention both to the parables and also to the actions carried out by Jesus. And he himself would move in circles in which he met the suspicious people, publicans and people who were ill, impure, ignorant. Um, Pope Francis uh, says that the title most applicable to Jesus is misericordia, is mercy, mercy. But mercy, not only in this general sense, but rather as one that is ready to open his heart and uh, embrace the person's suffering. Time and time again, Jesus says very clearly that he has not come for those who are fair, but rather for those who sin. But his mercy is demanding at the same time. Although obviously we don't, we cannot record the conversation, right? Uh, we don't have those conversations, but obviously something happened there when mercy was being defined and described. And Zacchaeus ended transformed out of that conversation. Let us talk about the two standards. We practically all live nowadays in competitive societies defined by a kind of reality. It's impossible to imagine a style of life that is not ascending. Our culture in as a whole tends to make us want to go up the staircase of success, whether this is realistic or not, but it's always going up individually, up and up. In fact, it would be fair to say that most of the people have been trained to believe, although we do have significant evidence to the contrary, but people have been trained to believe that they, if they are, they don't manage to go up 
that staircase towards success, they are to blame. Or well, at least that's the common sense idea and they resist. They don't want to see the structural causes of inequality quite often. So in a certain way, this uh, ascending mobility is, is curious really because in a very deep place in our hearts, I think that we all know that success, money, fame, applause, recognition, don't even give us inner peace. And they don't give us the deep, deep joy that we desire. And even so, most people don't, unfortunately, they don't associate the gospel with descending mobility. At least it's the impression I have. And that's why to contemplate the different uh, parts of the Gospels helps impregnate with that uh, style of poor and humble Jesus that is all the time inviting us to walk with him in poverty and in humility. Those who are poor and humble socially are called to feel comforted and consoled with this proximity of the Lord. For the poor peoples, they might not know anything formal about the two standards or the three humility ways, but in most cases, they live this existential dignity regarding Jesus. And furthermore, within popular wisdom, there's this deep intuition about the fact that living in a simple manner is done in order to be able to share with the others. I would say on the basis of the two standards, right? Uh, God's banner, I mean, it's uh, to live in a poor style in order to be able to share with the others. And this is something that I saw all the time when I was in El Agustino, the people who had nothing were always, always ready to share what very little they had. Truly, it was impressive to see. So let me go quickly on to the third and fourth weeks. In following Jesus in the third week, sooner or later, we all find the cross. And Saint Ignatius invites us to contemplate the sufferings of Jesus and up to what is possible, fine tune into that anguish, that solitude, the unfairness of his situation, including God's silence that Jesus felt. And in more than one occasion, those in the margins of society, those excluded, live all the time this third week in this way. All you have to do is come close to refugees or inmates in order to realize that they are daily living the passion of Jesus Christ. In many, many cases, their daily, lay, lie, their daily lives is Calvary. It's just untenable. The list of problems they have is long. They have uh, malnutrition, illness, mm, no employment or they are sacked in an unexpected manner, no medical attention, the lack of a voice in so many situations. And I very often have given exercises to middle-class people and some, well, frequently I heard them to say, listen, it's difficult to meditate on the passion of Christ. They say to me, it's difficult for me to enter the passion. However, poor people do uh, extract strength and force out of the third week because most of them have experienced what uh, St. Paul tells us. We have this treasure in vessels of clay so that this force, this strength that comes from God, not from us can be seen. Because those of us dedicated to death for Jesus, the life of Christ is manifested in us. And because of this, we never, never lose our consolation and we continue forward. So then the question is, can we say the same? Wouldn't it be great? St. Ignatius said the divinity hides. 
So it would be interesting and also quite transformative to place ourselves in a position of learning with people who typically live in a situation of poverty or exclusion. They yell at God in desperation, like Job. Or is there other words similar to the words of Jesus on the cross? When we have the privilege, truly the privilege of accompanying uh, persons who are marginated in this third week, I think we really have to take our shoes off because we are treading holy ground. At least that's my experience, I must say. And the fourth week, the resurrected presents to his friends as a consoling person. He himself is looking for his disciples where they were hidden or lost. But eventually the disciples have to go back to everyday life and there they find Jesus but crucified, now resurrected. Faith in the resurrection is lived as an experience that uh, is done slowly and gradually. Faith in resurrection cannot be just another added article of the credo or an obligation of the faith. Rather, it has to be something like what happened with, uh, with Thomas. Any disciple needs a first-hand experience. I think that sometimes Thomas um, is, is unfairly criticized, but in a way what Thomas was reclaiming is to have a personal experience. We all have a right to, to ask for the same, to have this first-hand experience. Because it's difficult to be a witness of Jesus if one hasn't been really a testimonial witness. The joy that Jesus offers his disciples is his own joy that is uh, actually coming from his intimate communion with him, with God, God who sent him. It is joy that does not separate the happy days from the sad days, the moments of success from the moments of failure, the experiences of honor from the experiences of dishonor, passion from resurrection. This joy is a divine gift which should in fact make us spend time and we should never lose this in times of illness, poverty, oppression or persecution. It is a joy which always makes us move away from the prison of the nest and it invites us to the house of love. Always proclaiming in us that death is not the last word although the noise, its noise, the noise of death is still very strong and its devastation is visible. The joy of Jesus elevates life for life to be celebrated and the poor know, and they know how to live this joy and they celebrate. I have never have had as many celebrations and parties in my life as I did during the 20 years I lived in El Agustino in an extremely poor place. Every night we had some party, very simple parties with these small biscuits and a bottle of wine for about 40 people. So each one would take, you know, a sip with the same glass, we would circulate, but there were parties every night in celebration. We open a new dining room, we have to have a party. So every small, every minor victory was uh, the reason to celebrate. And this is something I learned. I learned a lot from the poor, their joy. So the peoples then are showing that joy in their celebrations. And these peoples also intuit that love has to be placed more on works and deeds than on words. The main virtue of our peoples is hope. Not like an abstract annunciation, but as a verb, as a commitment, as an action, and as a relation. It is not individual hope, but rather collective hope. It is co-hope. And at the same time, maybe 
we have to incorporate what is Pentecostal more in the way of understanding and living the faith. But, uh, well, this with this I come to an end. Well, as I say recently, well, currently I am giving the exercises in prison. For me, this is a, a, an extremely interesting experience. It's the first time I do so. And they're not called spiritual exercises, but I call it the life examined, how to acquire greater freedom in prison. So inner freedom being in prison. And I work with them eight weeks in groups of eight persons, small groups, and they can freely write down their name. We always have more than we can take. And this year I've had eight groups and next year I expect to have 16 or even 32 groups. It depends, but um, happily enough, we do have scholars, young Jesuits there who are studying in Loyola and I, I hope to convince many of them to accompany me and work with me in prison because they, all of them have done the exercises, of course, and so been directing a spiritual course. So they would do a, a very good job, better than me, possibly. Well, with this, I come to an end. I, I hope I've gone well over my time. I think that the adaptation of the exercises that we all desire to explore nowadays is not only for the people who are excluded and marginated, but rather from and with them, those excluded from society with them, men and women. So it means a new approach, a new coming close of us to them, the excluded. And this represents not only a new sector of the population, but also a new standpoint from which to um, develop our task with a new group of interlocutors. Essentially, we are uniting two of the universal apostolic preferences, the first and the second, and the people, the, the poor can teach us a lot to work with those who are excluded and marginated is not so much a, a favor that we grant, and of course they are very grateful about it indeed, but rather um, the promises of its being a source of grace for us and for all the society. And I think that this process indeed will contribute much to the new culture of encounter that we all wish for and that Francis talks about. Thank you. And excuse me for going over my time. Thank you. Muchas gracias, Dan, por... Thank you so much for um, putting on to words the things that we feel being uh, just uh, together with uh, marginalized people, with excluded people, and the fact that faith and justice go by hand by hand. So you have put this into words. You have shown how this change, the way we see the world, how we understand God, and you have also analyzed different moments of the process of the exercises underlining the more uh, original way with, in this relation with marginalized and excluded people. So I think it would be good now to just uh, maybe react for a few minutes to what we have just heard. So maybe there are remarks or comments or questions to what you just heard. Biko. Nico. Please, Nico. Yes, we wait for the mic to come. Thank you. Uh, 
Is it working? Yo puedo repetir tu pregunta. Lo que nos contaste, la mayoría de los pobladores de este barrio o de este cerro eran migrantes. Sí, exactamente. I'm sorry, we're not receiving any sound. Claro que sí. Sí, hermano. Eh, eh, pregunta, Espera, es, pregunta, repite la pregunta. Ah, eh, eh, Vico preguntaba. Okay, so we'll repeat the question for you. Vico was asking about the spirituality of indigenous people coming from the Andes to Lima. Because we saw a, such a deep spirituality um, in them that we did not see the need to work the exercises with them. First of all, because uh, it was not possible they were working from 4 a.m. to 10 p.m., but we saw them in them a uh, very deep spirituality. With popular practices, as we were saying yesterday, with expressions that were different from ours, but we respected that. But we saw the need to work on the exercises with their children, with the next generation, because they did not have that deepness, depth. They were born in a city which, such as Lima, which was much more secular than the Andes. So we decided to work with the youth in particular concerning the exercises because adults somehow they were rooted already they had you know they were rooted in god in the earth in the community however you young people that's not the case they are very much lost i would say any other questions nora We'll finish with Nora then. Thank you very much for sharing your presentation. I would like, if possible, to you to mention the main aspects of how they live the faith, not only in the experience in Lima, but the experience of people that are the, the inmates, people imprisoned. You were talking about contemplation, to reach love, but how is that translated in in the life of the inmates? Of course, we're talking about different groups. In the parish where I am, with uh, plenty of migrants, we do the spiritual exercises for all the people that want. During the pandemics, for instance, we did the exercise. The exercises, uh, we were, I don't know, 18, 19, Mm, yeah, more or less. And we were doing the exercises for 150 people during two weeks. Everyone was reading the same text every day. I don't know whether you know about the Ignatian Adventure, a book. So we were all following the same exercises every day. And then once per week, there was a meeting with uh, small communities of six people to share the faith. We were not really doing theological conversation, but sharing, you know, the experience of the week. And that was a very good experience. It's very different in prison. In prison, uh, you know, there is a lot of noise. It's horrible. It's horrible. It's incredible the amount of noise in prison. So how to do these um, Ignatian exam in, in, in with so much noise, they are mystics somehow, they, they become mystics. It's incredible because one thing is to learn how to preach in a monastery and then something different is to preach in prison. And we try to help them and they are helping and teaching much more to me. They are 
teaching a lot to me, but I think that they are taking a lot of advantage of the exercises too. We learn being, you know, strange people to them because, um, of course, I thought they don't know me, I don't know them. By the way, they are all poor in prison. Rich people, they always, you know, escape from prison or they just do not enter into prison. The um, average class, they can uh, pay for the for their freedom and they stay at home till they have a process. So what the people that are in prison are the poor people. And most of them are there for three, four years without having a sentence, without having yeah, a sentence. So that's the situation, the system, at least in the US, and I think that in many other countries is completely broken. There is never money. We have been asking for money in Washington to reform the justice system in Chicago. Never there is money, never. But now with the war in Ukraine, of course, we are sending millions and millions of money, just like that, just like that. It's incredible. So there is no money for certain things, but there is a lot of money for other things, especially for war. But I'm not replying your questions. Apologies. I was, you know, being taken by my own emotion. We have time to keep on uh, shattering. Um, and sharing uh, during the uh, break. So we go for the coffee break and we see each other here in uh, 10 minutes. Thank you.